So you're going to the Canton Fair for the first time or if you've been before, but you want to get the absolute best results from your trip, but you're not quite sure what questions to ask the manufacturers when you go into the booths. Luckily for you guys, I've been going to the Canton Fair for over 13 years now. My first Canton Fair was November 1st, 2010. And let's just say over each Canton Fair, you would have over 200 discussions times that by over 24 fairs that I've done. I'm bringing you my top seven questions to ask a manufacturer from over 5,000 conversations that I've had over the last 13 years. So let's get into it. Hey guys, so if you're new to the channel, my name is Kian Gozari and I've been living and working in China for the past 13 years. In that time, I've designed, developed, sourced and manufactured over two and a half thousand products, visited more than 500 factories and attended more than 23 Canton fairs. That has led me to manufacture for a lot of brands, retailers and licenses, such as the NBA, the Olympics, the United Nations, uh, plus a lot of big box retailers in UK, Europe and the US, plus a lot of Amazon and private label sellers, as well as sellers in the crowdfunding industry as well. A lot of those products sit in this warehouse here today as well and in today's video I want to best prepare you for the Canton Fair. Now when you go to the Canton Fair we're gonna have loads of amazing conversations and we're about to get into the top seven questions to be asking your manufacturers but regardless of what questions that we ask the main way for you to get to the best results is the quality of notes that you take. So some people like to take notes on a notepad. I like, I'm still old school, I like to take a notepad with me. I like to staple all the business cards. If we're talking about, you know, materials and fabrics, I like to get a little cutting of that. I like to stamp that into my book as well. So most often the suppliers will also take notes as well, but it's very, very important for you to take detailed notes of your discussion and also the manufacturer will take detailed notes. And then after in the evening or when you get back from your trip, to then summarize all your notes in an email and send it to the supplier so they can also confirm what you wrote down is correct as well. And if you do that on your phone as well, if you write notes on your laptop, exact same process applies. You write down your notes, make sure they've written down their notes and then confirm it by email as well so you're both singing from the same sheet. Now, let's get into my top seven questions, top seven questions to be asking your manufacturers. Question number one. Are you a trading company or are you a factory? Now, when you go to the Canton Fair, you're gonna see there's many different factories, there's many different trading companies. And like I said, I've done over two and a half thousand products. A lot of them have been bought by trading companies, but there's this notion or there's this little misconception that, hey, if I buy from a trading company, I'm not necessarily getting the best price for my products. I better buy directly from a factory. So I'm ensuring that I'm getting the best price. Whereas sometimes I've actually gotten just as good pricing from trading companies as I have from factories. Because bear in mind, trading companies have many, many different customers and they're bringing many orders to that factory. So sometimes they get a kickback from the factory and they actually get paid off of the profit that the factory is making and they hand that to the trading company for bringing them more customers. So that's not always that we're gonna get better pricing from a factory. Sometimes it can be the same. It's okay to work with trading companies and it's okay to work with factories, but what's really, really important is that you know who you're working with. So you know what strings you can pull, what levers you can pull in the negotiation. So for example, a trading company will have lots of really good relationships with different factories. For example, if I'm doing a pet product, right, or let's, let's just say a gym product, right, if you see a trading company for, for a gym and you will see like yoga mats, you'll see cycle bikes, you'll see ab rollers, you'll see loads of different types of products, but the bikes are not made in the same factory of the weight discs and the bench press, and that's not made in the same factory as the yoga mat, but they can offer you all those products because they're a trading company and they have relations with all those factories. So if you just want to deal with one person, one company, which has good communication, a very nice showroom, they speak good English, then you're probably better suited to work for a trading company and probably you'll get lower minimum order quantities as well because that trading company is placing through their other customers a lot of volume to the other factories. So it makes sense for you to work for a trading company until you get bigger, then you can go directly to the factory. Now, if you've already got volume, you've already got scale in your business and you want to place an order for 10,000 pieces of a bike, then go direct to the bike factory because they're more likely to offer you, let's say credit terms on your order. They might take less of a deposit or they might give you financing 45 days or something like that. Now, a trading company can't necessarily give you financing because they're not the ones holding the raw materials. They're not the one purchasing the materials. They're not the ones which pay the workers like 30 days later or anything like that. So you can get maybe better credit terms from a factory, you can get more diversity of products from a trading company. But the reason I start with, are you a trading company or are, are you a factory, is not to try and maneuver trading companies out of it, but it's more to know who I'm doing business with, what levers I can pull, and what is better suited for me to work with based on the size of my inquiry as well. 
one final thing I'll mention about trading companies as well is that sometimes trading companies have partnerships with factories as well. So they might be invested in the factory. While they don't own it, they might have bought like a 20% share in it or something like that. So whenever you work for a trading company and they can offer you a variety of different products, always ask the factory, always ask the trading company, what are your core products and what are the products that you specialize in? Because going back to that gym example, they might say, we're invested in a factory which makes the yoga mats. We do over 5 million pieces of yoga mats per month. You will absolutely get the best price from us if you purchase from us. But they might not have such good cooperation with like maybe the bike factory or like the ab wheeler factory. So for that reason, you want to ask them, what are your core products? What products do you really specialize in? What products do you do the most volume in? Because the more volume they do, that's where you can get better discounts and better economies of scale. So if you are working for a trading company, just get a better understanding of who their partners are. Do they have any ownership in them? And what are their core products? And what are the products that they really, really specialize in? Okay, so question number two I like to ask is how many workers do you have in your factory? Now, this is really important for us to get a gauge and an understanding of the size and scale of the factory, right? So for example, if I'm doing a brand new product, I just wanna trial it, I've never done it before, and I only want to order 300 pieces, I'm way more likely to get that from a factory which has got maybe 50 workers than a factory which has got 2,000 workers. A factory which has got 2,000 workers has already got built up systems and processes and long production lines and then they have to really train all the workers how to make that item and by the time that they've made those 300 units then they have to switch it to another item because your order is already done so it's not really cost effective or efficient for them to take on a low moq but a factory of 50 pieces is a little bit more like nimble and easy to work with and willing to try new things because while they might not make money from this 300 piece order they might want to acquire you as a customer because they believe that your product will grow and scale and at least they will be your factory to, to build with you moving forward. To flip that, if I had a product which I'm an established seller, I'm doing very, very well, but I've just maybe had some quality issues with my previous manufacturer and I'm bringing to them an order of 10,000 pieces, then I would much rather work the factory which has got 2,000 workers than the factory which has got 50 workers. So I like to ask just how many workers do you have in the factory to get an understanding of their scale, their size, their capacity. Another question around this is you could say like how many units can you manufacture of this product per month? And you're likely to get a similar answer based on the number of workers that they have. But I always like to get an understanding of how many workers they have uh, just so that I know is my order size suited to this type of factory. Hey guys, if you are getting value from this video, please subscribe to the channel and hit that thumbs up button. It greatly, greatly helps the channel because I see a lot of you guys watch the videos but aren't necessarily subscribed. The more people that subscribe, the more videos I can make and the more high quality guests I can bring onto the show as well and make more videos inside the Canton Fair and other parts of factories as well. And if you do have any questions about the Canton Fair, I have made two previous videos inside the fair, one on developing products and one just a live walkthrough and demo of interactions with suppliers. So I'll link both of those down in the description down below for you guys to check them out as well. So question number three I like to ask is which markets do you supply? Now this is another way of asking like where's your attention going? So for example, if I know that I'm gonna sell my product in the US market and they say, yeah, 60% of our exports go to the US market, 20% go to Europe and 20% go to South America. I'm like, that's great because then they're familiar with the standards, the certifications, the regulations, the packaging requirements of the US market because they already supply that market. Like, let's say for example in California they have different regulations for like chemicals and testing and things like that but that means that they should already have those certificates they should already comply with those regulations if they already supply that market but if I want to supply the US market and they tell me that they only do the domestic Chinese market and let's say the African market then I'm like well you guys don't even know what certification is required for me to sell this product in the US market so it's unlikely that you'll be able to pass so that's not maybe not necessarily a good factory for me and then within those markets I always ask who is your biggest customers because again I want to know where their attention is going if I'm doing an outdoor brand and I say, who are your biggest customers? And they tell me Patagonia, Osprey, North Face, then I know the sort of quality levels are capable of making. But then if they give me a really budget brands that I've never heard of, then I don't know if their quality levels are capable to manufacture for me. So I like to know which markets do you supply and within those markets, who is your biggest customer as well? Then I get a good idea of their quality level and if they're the right fit for me to supply the, the market that I also want to sell into. 
So question number four I also like to ask, which is kind of lead on to this, is that have you ever supplied any big retailers or department stores? And the reason I like to ask this is that if you think of the big retailers like your Walmart, your Target, your Bed Bath & Beyond, maybe like Disney, some, a license like that, the bigger customers that they work with, the more strict their quality processes are because these guys, they go in and they do individual audits. You'll see when you walk to Canton Fair that they'll have certification to say that we have the Walmart audit, we have the Disney audit. There's another one called SEDEX. I was a board member for them for a few years as well. The bigger companies that they supply, the more regulations and more certifications that they have within their factory. And they're just a more quality driven factory, right? And on top of that, it also means that we can get the best prices with those factories because I know they have economies of scale. When a company like Walmart or Disney or Target or Bed Bath & Beyond buys from a factory, they tend to be buying hundreds of thousands of units at a time. And the better relationship you can build with that factory, which you can do there and then at the Canton Fair, the more likely you are to get better results. For example, you can't ask this on day one, but once you've built up a bit of a rapport with the factory and you find out, okay, they're doing 100,000 units for Walmart, let's just say they're doing this light blue jacket for Walmart, right? And I really like this material, but I don't want to do this product. I don't want to like copy this product. Maybe I want to get rid of the pockets. I don't want to make the jacket a little bit longer and I want to have it short sleeve, something like that. I would say, look, next time you get an order from Walmart um, for 100,000 pieces, I only want to order 2,000 pieces, but I'm going to add my 2,000 pieces. I'll give you that order when you get your order from Walmart. So they'll say we get uh, orders from Walmart quarterly. Cool let me know when you get the order and I'll give you my order straight away as well. So that when you order your raw materials for Walmart, you'll also add mine onto the back. So I'm benefiting from their economies of scale of 100,000 pieces, even though I'm only ordering 2,000 pieces. It's the same material, but it's a different product. So I can start to pull these strings and I start to get these price advantages once I understand who is their biggest customers and uh, when they order. And I only get that once I build a, a good relationship with them. But the first thing I want to ask is that what big department stores, what big retail stores, what big licenses do you supply? And then I can start to figure out later on how I can use that to my advantage. So question number five I like to ask is, do you supply any brands selling on Amazon? And whether the answer is yes or no, it doesn't really matter. But again, like the trading company or the factory, I just want to know what who I'm dealing with, right? Because if they say, yes, we supply brand selling on Amazon, I'm like, fantastic, because now you understand the labeling requirements, you know, you understand the damage it is to be out of stock, you understand how damaging negative reviews can be, so the quality has to be very good. But if they say, no, we don't supply any brand selling on Amazon, I'm like, well, good. It also means that like my competition doesn't buy from this factory. So when I launch this product on Amazon, at least I'm not competing with, with the other guys. Like for example, if I'm getting a very good price or if I'm getting a very good feature on my product, I know that other people selling on Amazon haven't tapped into that yet. And then I could also negotiate some sort of exclusivity agreement so they don't supply my competition. But it's very, very important for me to understand, are you supplying the brand selling on Amazon? But as a follow-up to that as well, I can also ask them, do you sell on Amazon? Have you ever sold on Amazon? Because I don't want to necessarily be buying from a factory, which is essentially my competition. Now, supplier's number one priority is not to sell on Amazon, it's to get orders for their factory because that is their bread and butter. Bear in mind, when you give a factory an order for 10,000 pieces, they ship out 10,000 pieces. So they sell 100 pieces of the units that they manufacture. But if you or I were to order 10,000 pieces and then you know we hold it in stock, we try and sell it online, we try to utilize influencers, we use like, you know, pay-per-clicks and Google SEO and stuff like that. And then we might only sell, you know, seven out of the 10,000 pieces and we're still left with 3,000, then we have to discount them. So that's why the manufacturer is not trying to sell um, products online as their main business because as a factory when whatever you order they ship out so they're making a hundred percent of they're selling a hundred percent of units that you order from them but I want to understand if they are selling there themselves because I don't necessarily want to be competing with them if they are manufacturing uh, and selling online themselves as well. Hey guys, so I hope you are enjoying this video. Don't forget to connect with me on social media. I'm gonna connect all my socials in the links in the description down below as well. And also if you do want to work with me on a one-on-one -on -one basis, or if you want, we have loads of cool things like documents, templates, forms. We've got quizzes for you to understand where you're at in your supply chain. Uh, we also organize China trips as well. So there's loads of cool things in the description down below. Just click that and you'll see hopefully something that, that fits for you. And then if you want to drop me a DM uh, on Instagram or join the free Facebook group, if you have any questions as well, that is all going to be linked here as well. Now let's get to the next question. So question number six, question number six is 
What new products have you been working on for this Canton Fair? So while we're product developers, while we develop new products all the time, we have new ideas for products. Well, so do the factories, because if the factories can develop new products and they can sell it to their existing customers, then they're going to get way more orders. So normally the Canton Fair happens twice a year. It happens in uh, April and May and in October and November. So every six months. And if they are making new ideas, new products, new samples for the Canton Fair, and they have hundreds of customers visiting them, the ones that they know who are serious, they'll show these new products to. But they don't often have them out front and center in display because if you're not a serious buyer, they don't necessarily want you to see that new idea and then share it with another, another supplier. And then the competition to these suppliers, like the other factories, are right there in the same hall. So they don't want to show off these cool new products they've been working on. But they still want to share this product with you if they feel that you're a serious buyer. So once I've had a bit of back and forth, built up a bit of rapport, and if you want to see how I do that, there's another video that I said I'll link down below, which is my walkthrough of the Canton Fair. You can see how I build up a relationship with these factories. And then you can ask them, hey, what new products have you been working on for the Canton Fair? What are the new products you've been working on in the last year? What are the new items that you're selling in the Brazil market, in the Japanese market, in the Germany market? What's something that you've not sold in the US yet, but you think is going quite well? You can have these conversations and get first mover advantage on any new products that they've been developing. And again, if you do see a new product that you like, you can ask for an exclusivity agreement as well. And this leads me to question number seven. Can I get exclusivity on this new product? So you can get exclusivity, which basically means they only sell that product to you and they don't sell it to anyone else. Now, if I came up with a new product, then I can protect that by getting a design patent or utility patent to block anyone else you know, selling that product. But if the factory makes a new product and that's something that I've not had any involvement in, but I want to sell it, but I don't want them to sell it to anyone else, I can ask for exclusivity. Now, normally you can get exclusivity in three ways. You can get exclusivity by quantity. So you can say like, hey, if I order 10,000 pieces, give me exclusivity and, and then you can't sell it to anyone else. They're like, okay, fine. Yeah, that makes sense. But you're not likely to get exclusivity if you just ask for 300 pieces because why would they not sell it to anyone else if you're only taking 300 pieces? But they'll protect you if you give them a high order quantity. So you could ask them, how many pieces do I need to order for, from you to be exclusive that you don't sell this to anyone else? That's number one. You can also get exclusivity by region. So you can say, look, I'm selling in the US market, make me exclusive for the US. I don't care who else you sell it to in Germany, in Europe, in Japan, in South America, sell it to whoever you want. But for US, you only supply me. So you could get exclusivity by region and then you can also get exclusivity by time. You can say, let me be exclusive for six months. Let me be exclusive for 90 days. Let me have exclusivity for one year and just work with them to see what time frame you can get. So you can get exclusivity by quantity, exclusivity by region, and you can get exclusivity by time as well. And just by having a bit of back and forth, let's see what we can get. But hopefully you can get protection on a brand new product from an amazing supplier that you met at the fair. And I've done this countless times as well. And that's part of the trips that are organized to China as well. So if you are interested in that, that will be linked down below for you guys as well. And just as a quick reminder, a quick pro tip, bear in mind that the last day of the Canton Fair is when all these factories pack up their goods and they're basically going back to the factory. Now, they brought a lot of goods with them to show uh, at this particular Canton Fair and they don't necessarily want to palletize it all, stack it all up and then sort of send it back to their showroom, especially because they've kind of been used a little bit now as well. So if you ever want a sample of what you've seen at the Canton Fair, always in your meetings say, hey, can I come back and collect a sample on the last day of the show? And quite often or not, if you've had a good conversation with them, they'll probably give this sample to you free of charge. Now, if they do ask you to pay for it, it's not for the money. It's more so they just want to see, are you a serious customer or not? Because if I ask for a free sample of, let's just say, um, an outdoor furniture camping chair, the supplier doesn't really know, does this person really want to order this product or do they just want a free sample of a chair? And if they say, look, the sample charge is $50 and you're like, cool, no problem, here's the $50. Then they're like, okay, cool. They're actually serious about ordering this product. They weren't just trying to get a free sample. And I've had plenty of situations before where I've been in discussions with a supplier at a booth and they say, look, the sample charge is 200 RMB. I go into my wallet, I give them the 200 RMB and they just give it right back to me just to say, oh, I just want to see if you were serious about this product. Or they say, look, I'll take the money for the sample, but once you place the order, I will refund this to you. I'll deduct this from the invoice. So the sample charge is just to show if you're serious or not, but you will get free samples uh, most often than not uh, on the last day of the Canton Fair. 
Hey guys, so in the link in the description down below, I've prepared a supply chain quiz for you. It'll give you guys a good idea of what you need to improve and optimize in your supply chain. It's totally free. It's got loads of free advice. And I've also got some giveaways and PDFs and checklists for you guys to download as well. So definitely check out the links in the description down below. Hey guys, I've had a lot of fun making this video um, for you guys. One final, final thing I wanna add, one other tip is kindness goes a long way. So there's a lot of big buyers that go to these shows and I've been there for so long and I've seen a lot of big buyers carry a big ego as well. Sometimes they can be rude to suppliers and just with everything, at the end of the day, people buy from people and as long as you're nice to these suppliers, they're very proud and they're very honored to, to deal with you and your business. No matter how big or small your order is, they like dealing with different people from different countries and solving problems through products. So just always be nice, always be kind, give them your attention, give them good eye contact, smile, take photos together, enjoy yourself, have a good time and that feeling will definitely be returned and they'll definitely treat you very very good as a customer as well and then you'll get amazing results if you apply these questions and have a smile on your face and just have a good time and if you have any questions about the Canton Fair let me know in the comments down below and if you do go to the Canton Fair for sure you'll run into me in the halls say hello say hi I'll be there and look forward to seeing you guys there to your success all the best and I'll see you soon